Jesus Christ, he said this to a crowd. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you'll find rest for your souls. Let that sink in for a minute. You'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We, we set that up and we told you last week, that is the anchor text for this series. Let me ask you a question like, I don't know, maybe even out in the lobby or with your family or you run into somebody at work and you sort of throw that question out to them, right? You say, how you doing? Right? And I don't know, the, the, what's the response? What do you give? What do you usually hear? Like, I, I often hear, fine. I'm fine. I'm good. Right? I know one that I feel like I've been saying or hearing a little bit more uh, over the last several years is, I'm busy. And sometimes it's like said to you like this, it's like, man, I'm, I'm busy. Like in other words, man, I'm, I'm exhausted. And sometimes, you know, somebody will say, I'm busy, but then, it, then, then at the end of it, you know, it, 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 there, there's this sort of maybe insincere phrase that goes like, hey man, I'm, I'm just living the dream, brother. See, we put this series intentionally here at the close of summer just as things seemingly are beginning to get busy, right? Things are gearing up. Schedules begin to fill. Vacations seem to be over now. And for many of us, doesn't it feel like, like we're just starting to pick up steam? And I'm going to make a really big, bold statement here. I believe that this series, if applied to your life, could determine how you finish 2016. I believe that if you apply this series and this content to your life and dig in, when you come through the holiday season and then close out 2016, you could come through it like, man, I'm, I really am good. My family's in a, in, in a good spot. And I believe if you don't and you just sort of ignore it, th there's a chance you could come through the end of this year, I'm exhausted. I'm busy. I'm just living the dream. I know for me, I get often asked, like, hey, Scott, what, you got like a life verse? You got a couple, like an Old Testament, New Testament, you know, favored verse? And really quickly in the Old Testament, I can almost say, like, rolls right off of my tongue. Yeah, Deuteronomy 29, 29. I love that it's 29, 29 because it's easy to remember. Like, Deuteronomy 29, 29, right? Are you familiar with this verse? I preached it. It's this one that says the secret things. You know, they belong to the Lord, but the things that are revealed to us belong to us and to our children. I've, I've grown to like love that verse and, and be able to embrace that verse so that when things are sort of happening that I just can't figure out, stuff going on in this world, I'm, I'm okay with the fact that I can't understand it all. Oh, I'm okay with the fact that God understands and God has secrets and there is a mystery to this. But then I love the back end of that, that, that verse when it says the things that are revealed, things such as his son Jesus Christ, those are the things that we can embrace and hold on to and pass on to our kids, right? Love that verse. Sometimes when people say, well, what about the New Testament, Scott? And I'll, I'll say, well, it's, it's that verse I just read a couple seconds ago to, to kick off this sermon, right? But you know what I, I got to tell you? I'll, I'll say that's my favorite verse. But, but I'm, I'm not going to be dishonest and tell you it's my life verse. Because as much as I love the beauty of that verse... Jesus saying, come, man, Scott, get that burden off. Give it to me. My yoke is easy and it's light. You're going to find some rest. As much as that's my favorite verse, I got to tell you, I struggle to make that my life verse because I struggle with rest. It's almost comical that the sermon that I get the week after a sabbatical is on something that I really have struggled with. You know, I, I don't do rest well. You can ask my wife. I don't unwind well. I can't stop thinking times and figuring things out in my head. I struggle sometimes to just be present in a conversation without a hundred thoughts and to do sort of spinning through my mind. I tend to get exhausted. I can really overwork and sometimes I take on way too many burdens and problems. How about you? Any fellow rest strugglers with me today? You know, Kent, he talked about where we went last week. So I just want to sort of, sort of set us up with where, where do I want to go over, over, our, over our time together today? Um, what does it even mean to find soul rest? Well, here it is. Here's my definition 
of soul rest. It's making a commitment to pursue God's love. And I put that that way, not just like this sort of vague general to pursue God. I put to pursue God's love. Here's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to give you some hows. How do we do this? But I'm just going to tell you right up front. The how, it's not complicated, right? It's the doing of it is where the difficulty comes in. Secondly, I just want to point out a few enemies of our rest. Because there's lots of enemies out there that come against our rest. And I'm going to touch on a few. There's lots. There's things like debt, right, that can be an enemy of your rest. And you've got a lot of debt. There's lots of enemies. I'm going to point out a few. I think some of them you're going to almost see coming. They'll be, like, predictable. Hopefully a couple of them I'll catch off guard, give you something to, to think about a bit. I have a section in this where I want to just talk to parents. How do you pass on this pursuit of God's love to your kids, Right? And so then instead of, you know, are you going to pass on soul rest to your kids or you're going to pass on a cycle of stress and busyness? And then I want to say this right up front before I sort of launch in. Um, I, Kent sort of said this last week. I, I, I want to say this. I think this is so hard in American culture. We've got so many distractions and competitors for our soul rest. It's just like any time you've ever been on a mission trip, right? And I don't know, I talk to people all the time, and myself, when I come back, I say, man, I met some people that had practically nothing in their life, desperate situa- situations, orphans. But my goodness, they seem to have such rest, such a complete connection with the Lord. How? Because they don't have all the distractions and the competitors for their soul, and they're so deeply connected to God, they've got rest. They've got peace. So so as Kent mentioned, I've been out the last five weeks on sabbatical. I think, just looking back at my schedule, I think it's the first time that I ever had more than nine days off in a row in my 25 plus years of ministry. And I just, I want to thank publicly our elders council. Um, Joel Reed is is down front here. He's one of our elder council members. Publicly, thank you um, for granting me, encouraging me this time. Um, Congregation, thank you for allowing me to step out. Kent Chevalier. Thank you for leading this particular campus um, in, in my absence. Um, I just want to say this, like, I know this might sound a little hokey. Like, I really missed you. Um, I'm not kidding. I really missed you. And I got to tell you something I missed, and I, I came here yesterday, and I couldn't wait. I missed worship. Visited some other churches while I was out, and I missed worship. That, that, that Be Enthroned song is on the New Bethel um, worship CD. It was a CD that was like a companion of mine for five weeks. I listened to it everywhere I went when I worked out. I mean, it just, that song is on there. That's a, that's a tremendous CD. If you're looking for something to engage in, pick up the New Bethel worship CD. Incredible. Wow. I missed you. You know, my first day of sabbatical, I looked at my calendar. I looked at my calendar on my, my uh, phone and I saw all my appointments for the next four weeks were still in there. Like, you know, I'm like, ah, suckers. Like, I'm like, <laughs> but I wanted to clear them off because I wanted to, like, start putting stuff in that I needed to do and some things I had planned. I wanted to plan a, tr- a trip to Sandcastle, you know, so I wanted to put that in there on my calendar. So I just went in there and started deleting everything off my calendar. Like, you know, executive team, Wednesdays at 11, delete. You know, teaching team, delete. All staff meeting, delete. I was just getting rid of them all. Well, it turns out that when I was doing that, it was deleting them off all the staff people's calendars too. <laughs> so they're like, Stephen's just stepped out. He, he just canceled everything for a, for a month. So I, um, you know, I did go to Sandcastle. I, I planned that. Sandcastle, man, um, un, un, unbelievable. You know, it's, it's a water park in Munhall. It's a people-watching festival, like, goodness sakes. We, we, went to, we lived over there, and we grew up going to that park when we were little. My kids always wanted to go back, so I said, yeah, we're going to go. We're gonna go so can, like, I forgot, and I don't think it's such a good idea. They sell beer there, like selling beer at a water park. Like, I saw dudes just sitting in a pool, drinking like six beers, and never getting up to go to the bathroom. Like, dear, you're going to the bathroom in the pool. I know you are. I just don't think it's a good idea to sell beer at a water park. Last week of sabbatical, I went on, we went on our family vacation, went to Anna Maria Island, Florida. I've never been there before. Amazing place. We arrived at the airport gate Saturday morning early to go, 
and um, flight to Tampa, and I look, and, you know, here we are, we're gathering up, and I look, and, and there, there's, there's another Northway couple there and their family at the gate, and I'm like, hey, you guys going to Florida too? You're like, yeah, they say, hey, we're going to Anna Marie Island. I said, oh, wow, how about that? So, so are we. It's a seven and a half mile island, thousands of beach rental places, right? There are three houses from us. Yeah, three houses over. <laughs> Saw them every day, every day, every day of the trip. But I want to say this, like seriously, wonderful couple, like unbelievable people, totally loved hanging out with them. Um, you know, the Lions family, if you're here, shout out to the Lions family. It was awesome hanging out with you. But um, you guys here, where are you at? Oh, I see John, yeah. Whoa, Lions family. <laughs> but I do want to remind you, we, we had that, whatever happens in Anna Marie Island stays in Anna Marie Island. <laughs> do not want to see on your Facebook Picture of me and my swim trunks drinking from a red Solo cup on the beach. Don't want to, we, we had a deal, right? During the trip, I, I had a, um, a five-day solitude trip just off by myself. That was intense. Over the month, I read through the New Testament three times in three different Bible translations. During the break, I decided right up front, I was going to take a, a, a fast from TV. And, and not maybe necessarily all TV, but like at least all junk TV and all news and all negativity. I was just going to get it out. I was going to watch a little Olympics, you know, rented a few movies, but everything else, nope. I'd just step out of my deck. If my daughter was watching something, I just didn't want to. And I got to tell you something, man. You know, being away from watching all those political commercials and mean-spirited, hateful dialogue, it was rest for my soul. Some advice to some of you that are just stressing out over this. And, and can I just say something? God's got it. All right? God's got this. So chill. It was, it was seriously like rest for my soul. I spent a lot of time praying about the church, praying about our next five years, praying about my personal time, um, my personal, well, where am I headed the next five years? And I told you throughout this sermon, I was going to point out some enemies to our own soul rest, okay? So, so here's the first one. When I was talking about this five-week sabbatical, how many of you thought to yourself, must be nice? Anywhere, come on, be honest. Any, anywhere, anywhere along there, are you thinking to yourself, must be nice to go on a solitary retreat, tutor retreat? I'd like a little solitude. <laughs> must be nice to just be able to step out of work for, for five weeks, right? A enemy of your soul rest, number one. It must be nice. Because that's just a nice way of comparing. It, it's, it's, and its heart is, is envy and, and, and jealousy. Do you get caught up in this must be nice? I do. I, I find myself saying that sometimes, right? How about you? You know, James 3.16 says, For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder. And every vile practice, disorder is the opposite of rest, right? Jealousy, comparison, envy causes disorder in your soul, right? Proverbs 14, 30, a tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. I don't know. Rotting bones doesn't sound restful to me at all. So, so you know, I, I think to myself as I was writing this, I was like, go ahead, yeah, you know, like, think to yourself, must be nice to have a five-week sabbatical, right? But, you know, can I, can I, can I, can I like, defend my sabbatical? See, there's a verse that haunts me from time to time. It's found in James 3.1. It says, Not many of you should become teachers or pastors, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So as a pastor and a preacher, one day i got to stand before God and be judged with greater strictness. Must be nice for all of you on the lenient end of that bell curve, right? Huh? Sometimes I think of my job as lead pastor at a large church as like one that I spent a lot of my time listening to opinions because you're the church and you all got opinions, right? You do, and, and you're not hesitant to share them with me anonymously or face-to-face -face or in an email, right? You, you know, I, I just think to myself, you know, I can't walk into Alcoa and say, hey, that presentation... Not one of your best, right? <laughs> can't, I can't stroll into PPG or someplace, you know, where you work and say, that decision you made, uh-uh, totally disagree. Like, sit down and talk to you about it. 
So, that brings me to my second sort of enemy of soul rest. Absorbing critical opinions. You know, you should have an inner circle of opinions that really matter to you. Close friends and family members, home group people, maybe mentors in your life, people that, that have your best interest at heart. Absorb those. But frankly, critical opinions from people on the fringe of relationship, people that don't know you or have your best interest at heart, you've got to stop absorbing them and trying to please everyone. People pleasing is cheap and it comes with a cost to your soul rest. Now I'm not saying that you shouldn't receive some constructive criticism and some really good feedback. Of course that's important. What I'm talking that was going to do damage to your soul is this absorbing it and dwelling on it and stressing it and holding on to it. Too often, I just, I just tell you, sometimes I'm lousy at soul rest. And for me, this is sometimes an enemy of my soul rest because I allow so many opinions out there of approving or disapproving to silence, right? God's spirit in here that is trying to speak rest and encouragement and truth to my soul. John 12, 43, it says, For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Right? Two enemies. I hope I sort of snuck up on you with these two. I tried to bring them out of nowhere just to catch you. Do you do this? Do you do this must be nice? Are you absorbing critical opinions too often, carrying them? They will. They will, they will mess with your soul rest. I just want to switch gears for a minute. I'm going to come back to some more enemies in a little bit. But I, I want to, if you've got your Bibles, Deuteronomy 6. Uh, probably a verse that you're familiar with, a few verses. While I read this to you, just these four or five simple verses, I want you to look and look for like three circles of pursuing God's love. Because there's three sort of what I would say, like from here, then to here, then to here, of pursuing God's love found in this text. This is, this is a text that found in these, in, particularly in these first few verses, are, are, the, are some of the most sacred texts in all of the Israelite religion. Like these are really important texts. Jesus quotes these, these, some of these verses back at folks in the New Testament. So, so in, in Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, it says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way. And when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Amazing text there. Did you pick up on sort of those three circles? If I had to ask you right now, if you had any guess to what those three are, as you're processing that in your mind, the first circle is this, this pursuit of God's love starts with yourself. And that was found right there in verse 5, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all, all your might, right? That's the first part of it. The first thing in the pursuit of God's love is finding truth and peace pursuing that rest, but here's the part that it's comma, it's on you. This first part is on you, right? Jesus has already done the work on the cross. That's what Kent spent almost the entire sermon talking about last week, right? So therefore, since he's done all that work, we need to pursue that love. Verse 5 is basically says what it means to be a Christian, Folks, and see if you can track with me on this. This is one of these things I write, and then I'm like, yeah, that makes great sense to me, but I don't know if it's going to make sense to anybody else. And so, so see if you can stay with me on this. But, but here it is, folks. We are not primarily thinking beings. See, see your life is not, not marked by what you think. Your life is marked by what you love. You with me? See, see we are primarily lovers and worshipers. See, you can say anything that you think with your mouth. You can say what you treasure, what you believe, what you stand for, but when all is said and done, it's driven by your loves. Our hearts and our loves drive us. And as Christians, if we give our lives to the pursuit of God's love, we will find soul rest. 
And maybe in this how process of finding soul rest, one of the first things that you need to do right now is determine and identify if there is anything currently in your life that you are pursuing with all your heart and all your soul and all your might more than you're pursuing God's love. If so, you've got to put that in its proper place, right? And this is not about pursuing God's commandments or do's and don'ts or rules, and it's certainly not about pursuing religion. I'm talking about the pursuit of God's love. So what are you potentially pursuing right now then you're pursuing more than God's love. Is it your education? Is it a particular man or a, a woman in, in your life right now? Is it your career? Is it time at the gym? Is it a hobby? Is it, is it making sure your kids have everything? If you were to pursue God's love more than that, what would it look like? So, so, so this is probably as close as I'm going to come in this sermon to describing like the how to pursue God's love. As I told you up front, I don't think it's complicated. It's just hard to commit to. So, so here we go. This is simply what it means to pursue soul rest. One, it's consistent time alone with God. With your Bible, with, with prayer, with honesty, and maybe with a journal, right? It's daily, five or six times a week. It's maybe a couple times a month, a little extended time getting up a little bit earlier, staying up a little later, taking that walk, and maybe a, maybe a few times a year. It's, a, it's an extended, lengthy time. And secondly, it's consistent time with other believers. It's church, it's home group, it's with your trusted discipler. Does that, does that sound hard? No, it, it's not. The, the, doing, the, the, the how part of it's not hard. It's the doing part that is a commitment. See, we are marked by what we love. And is your time and passion and schedule marked by pursuing God's love? And if the answer is no, my guess is you're not experiencing soul rest, at least to the fullest. Have you ever had this conversation? Maybe it's just a couple people. Maybe it's a group. Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's like, you know, you're watching your kids practice or something, and there's just some of you you're sitting around sort of chatting. The conversation goes something like this. I'm so busy. Man, I'm just so busy. There doesn't seem to be enough hours in the days or days in the week right? I, I just seem like I run from one thing to the next. And, you know, you're sitting there talking to people. And typically, that kind of conversation, I don't know about you, but it usually ends with somebody, and maybe it's you, that, that just says this. But what are you going to do? And everybody else sort of murmurs, yeah, you're right. I don't know. What are, we, what are you going to do? It is what it is. Busy. C can I just ask you that question a little differently? What are you going to do if you're that busy it's on you okay right you can blame it on someone else you can rationalize that it's all good things necessary things important things but first and foremost you've got to realize that you did this you made a choice if your schedule is limiting your your sort of ability to pursue God's love and God's rest it's on you I read a book, learned a lot of books on sabbatical. I got to say, probably the, my favorite book was a quick little book, great little book called Present Over Perfect by Shauna Nequist. I've, I've recommended her stuff before. She's an incredible writer and, and teacher. Um, in this book, she calls what I just talked about, called, she calls it You Set Up the Chairs. You put all that stuff in your schedule. If you don't have any time to pursue uh, you know, a quiet, unhurried time with God, to be at church, to be in a home group, then take down some chairs. Enemy of our soul number three is you put up too many chairs. And another way to put this is for some of us, and I know I struggle with this, you got to learn how to say no. How are you at saying no? You don't have to say yes to everything and everyone because when you do, it'll cost you your soul rest. Even saying no to like really good things, you gotta learn to do. Take down some chairs, learn to say no. So back to the book of Deuteronomy, the sort of the first circle was pursuing God's love for ourselves. It's our commitment, it's on us. And the second one, did anybody pick up on it, what it was, the shift of gears there? It was in verse seven where it says, you shall teach these diligently to your kids, right? 
And it goes on to you know, explain how to do that. When you sit, when you stand, when you go to bed, you know, teach these with your kids. I told you earlier, I want to spend just a couple minutes talking to parents. So here we go. And the rest of you, don't check out, please, because I really think there's stuff in here for all of us, for, clearly for grandparents, if your kids are grown, but also for those of you that just are in contact with kids, with students. There's stuff in here. Folks, if you're a parent, you are making a disciple. If you have one kid, you're making one disciple. If you've got two kids, two disciples. Three kids, right? You get me. If you're a parent, you're making disciples. A disciple is, is nothing more than a student or a follower of a teacher or a leader. Parents, you are teaching and leading your children. Every time your child does something that you do, or talks like you, or acts like you, roots for the same team you root for, you're making disciples. You are. If you, if you have kids, you're making disciples. The question is not whether or not you're making disciples. The question is, what are you discipling them towards? You are shaping their world for them. You are showing them what's important and what's not. You're showing them what your family is going to orient itself around and what they're not. You're going to show them what is of value and what is not. And parents, if you're not valuing the pursuit of God's love, being committed to soul rest, then it's likely your children won't either. And first of all, I just want to say this up front to parents. I'm not trying to do any drive-by guilting here because, man, I have not done this. I'm not standing up here as like, do as I do. This is how you do this. I've, I've struggled with this with my kids. My goal in the next couple minutes is really not to paralyze you about the task of passing on God's love and the pursuit of God's love to your kids. My hope is you leave here in these next couple minutes and you say, man, I can do this. I can, I can disciple my kids to pursue God's love. So, so two really simple terms, two really simple concepts when it comes to passing this on to your kids. One is model this to them consistently, right? I'm not saying don't teach it. You don't have to preach it. You don't have to say anything. Just model it in front of them. Read your Bible in front of them. Mention to them, hey man, I'm going, getting out of here for, a, for an afternoon. Mommy's going to handle things or daddy's going to handle things. And I'm going to go be, spend some time, quiet time with the Lord. Just model it out in, in front of them. Go to church. Have their home group meet in your house. Explain to your kids what it is you're doing. Just model it out. Model it. They'll catch it, and it'll change the trajectory of their life. And the second thing is this, and you might think this is more difficult, but I'm here to tell you it's not. I just want to challenge you. Take those, those consistent moments in your life and talk about God's love. Find some consistent moments and just talk about God's love. And some of you are saying, well, when, Scott? I don't know what to do. I'm so busy. And I'm telling you, well, the Scripture said it. When you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise, right? You sit with your kids, right? You know, you, you, you walk with them sometimes, don't you? They're in the car with you. You're chucking McNuggets back to them on the way to soccer practice, right? You put in the bed. You're waking up with them. You can do this. You've got time. You can have a consistent conversation and find some moments in that conversation to talk about God's love. It, it's, it's seriously, don't overcomplicate this. You can read a scripture together, a couple verses, and say, what do you think God meant by that? Where do you see God's love in there? You can play that high-low game, right, man? You guys do this with your kids, right, at dinner time or at bedtime. What's your high of the day? What's your low of the day? Your kid tells you you're high, like, man, you say, let's praise God for that. God's a good God. He gave you that high today. He tells you you're low. You say, man, where do you think God was in that? How do you think God feels because you felt sad about that? It's just a conversation. Our kids' ministry gives you take-home materials. Our student ministry has websites that you can hit and, and, and figure out what they talked about there so that you can follow it up and talk about it. You know, Google it. There's stuff out there just to have simple spiritual conversations with your kids. And parents, I just want to say this. What I want to identify what I think is a couple, because like we've got enemies to our soul rest, but kids got enemies to their soul rest too. And I'm going to do two. There's more. Again, I'm just going to talk about two here that I think are enemies to our kids' soul rest. And the one, I just called it this, it's a big category, I called it misplaced love. But what do I mean by that? Your kids are going to pick up on what you love most. If all you do is talk to them about their sports and their grades and their looks, your kids are going to believe that is where their worth comes from. And they're going to begin to pursue that, and it's going to come up empty for them. But if you talk more about the pursuit of God's love, God's love in their life, then they're going to discover that's where their worth comes from, and they're going to pursue that. There's so many things I can talk about misplaced love here, but I'm just going to talk 
about two real quickly. I've been off for five weeks. My, my email box is empty, so I'm going to step on some toes on my first week back, and I'm to, you, Scott S. at Northway, okay? So you can just email me. I'm back. I'm refreshed. I'm ready, okay? But, but here we go. The first one is this. First sort of toe stepper on this misplaced love. Parents, would you please be careful about these highly competitive sports leagues? And, and you know, whether it's dance clubs, cheerleading, soccer, hockey, please be careful. I'm talking about the ones that are countless hours of practice and travel and a lot of resource. You do realize this is a middle class and affluent thing. This is something brand new sort of in the world, in our world, over the last 15 or 20 years. And reports and statistics are starting to come back from kids that have been involved in this. And one of them says that 45% of these kids in these highly competitive leagues, they quit by the age of 11 and they never pick up that activity again. That's tragic. The numbered one and two reason they say is why. It's one, they weren't having any fun. And two, their parents put too much pressure on them. Yeah, I don't know. I think in 20 years from now, we might look back and say, we might have been missing something there. Can I just tell you, man, if you're involved in this, and I know, I, you know you're like, well, yeah, but we, we do this, and we make it a family thing. And I, I get it. You can leverage that, and it works. For a lot of you, it's working. So please. But can I, maybe here's something crazy. Here's a crazy idea for you. Take a year off. All right. How about a summer? Take that time that resource, that money, and do something incredible with your family. Do something that will connect you all at a deep, heart, spiritual level. The second one is this, and I'm going to upset some middle schoolers in the room. Middle school kids, I, I don't think, parents, I'm just sorry, I'm just going to say this, they should not be dating or anything even close to dating, right? And so you're saying, well, that's... That's great, Scott. That's, like, that's your opinion, and that's, that's cool. But I got Scripture, Solomon, Solomon, Song of Solomon 8, 4. It says this, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Another translation that says this, Oh, let me warn you, sisters, you can put brothers in there too, in Jerusalem, don't excite love, don't stir it up until the time is right. Middle school kids can't drive, they can't vote, they can't watch R-rated movies. Why do we want to entangle them, right? And introduce them to romance, I've seen this happen, and it consumes middle school kids, and breakups, because they're not mature enough for that, are awful, and they don't cause rest for anybody, right? I could go a lot of other ways in this sort of unwelcome, I mean, misplaced love. There's just a couple of them there. I want to stick to the second sort of category of what I think causes our kids, you know, to not find its enemies against their, their soul rest. And, and I just want to preface this by saying, man, like if you're a single mom or you've been through a difficult divorce, I get it. And I know some of you, man, you're trying so hard and we're so proud of you. And we've done sermons directed directly at single moms and, and, and you know, we're with you. But, but I just want to say this to like the broader group of folks that are married into this room. So if, if that's, if some, of you, some of you are going to pick up an offense here and take it on. I'm telling you not to, okay? But I'm just going to set this, this second sort of big category. And, and here it is, of enemies to our kids' soul rest is weak marriages. And what do I mean by that? Marriages that are maybe marked by consistent coldness. And I'm not talking about a tough time or a few bad weeks or a challenging season. I mean a marriage that basically is an extended sort of roommate thing going on. Get some help because your kids are going to pick up on that. They're going to feel that coldness, right? They're going to be stressed. Kids want their parents to be in love. They do. They want them to show affection. They want them to know that your marriage is solid. One of the best things you can do is occasionally gross your kids out in front of them by flirting with your wife do it. And they're going to say, that's disgusting, but I tell you, they're going to feel safe. They're going to find rest there. Second, if the opposite of that, if your marriage is always at 170 degrees, always at a boiling point, right? There's so much tension and stress in the house that the kids are walking are always, always unsure of who's going to explode next. Next, They're not going to find soul rest there. And I'm not talking about those occasional moments where you lose your temper and say something foolish. In fact, those are great moments to model the gospel to your kids. Say, man, I blew that. I, Dad and I, we blew that one. I'm sorry. You can model forgiveness in those moments. I'm not talking about those moments. Folks, if your marriage is weak, if it's struggling, can I just encourage you? I'm not trying to do any drive-by guilting on here. I'm saying get some help and let us help you. Find out when the next marriage matters 
class is going to take place, get together with your pastor. You know, we, we've got professional marriage counselors and count, Christian counselors on all of our, our locations, all of our campuses. Let us come alongside you and try to help. And then finally, this third sort of movement that's found in Deuteronomy, this pursuit first. We've got to do this ourselves for ourselves. We've got to pass it on to our kids. And then you pick up the third movement. It was basically, we've got to take it out into the world. That sort of text at the end there was sort of some of that odd language about, you know, bind it on your hand and frontlets on your, you know, back in the times that the, the Jewish folks used to sometimes wear a box with the, with, the, with the scriptures inside of it and band it on their head so they'd walk out so everybody would know, like, hey, man, this is what I believe, this is what I follow. Some of us, that's what we need to do. We need to take out of the soul rest that we've got and take it out into the world, in our workplace, in our homes, in our friendships, in our neighborhoods, so that people can see that. They can see that we've got God's rest on our soul. And can I just tell this man, like, like if you are a mean-spirited, nasty, you know, stressed out, grumpy all the time, angry, frustrated person, don't tell them you go to Northway. Don't, don't tell people that out there in the world. Because what I've found is people with really true soul rest in their hearts, people that are developing this, this love of God, what, what they've, got, they've got, they've got something going on where people say, like, man, you are experiencing the same mess I am. You are struggling with some of the same stuff I am. Your kids are, are, are struggling with it, but you don't, you don't seem to be losing your mind. Why? And you can say, because I got rest for my soul. I got a God, like Billy Bob said, that goes out before me. He's my friend. Stands behind me. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm reeling, I'm hurting, I'm struggling with this. But I've got joy and peace. I've got rest. People will come to you and ask you that when you have this true rest. In three of the four Gospels, Jesus says something like this. I'll read this one from the Gospel of Mark. He says, For what does it profit a man to gain the world and forfeit his soul? What is he saying there? He said, What good is it? What good is it for all this busyness and success that we're striving for and work and, you know, and accomplishments if you lose your soul? Rest in the process. Northway, I've seen too many friends of mine and folks that I'm close with that this is, looks like that their pursuit of God's love. It's like this. Man, I'm pursuing God's love. It's awesome. Oh, my goodness, I haven't done uh, I'm stressed out. I don't even know if there is a God anymore. Oh, I'm pursuing God's love, and uh, I don't even know. Did you catch the couple word, this one word that I said over and over in our time together today? It was consistent. Your pursuit of God's love should look like this. Man, I love God. Okay, a little difficult time here. Man, I love God. We're doing so good. I'm pursuing him. Man, my quiet time is strong. My quiet time's a little off. That should be what it should look like, consistent, not these whoosh and major ups and downs. You need to find a rhythm, a rhythm of pursuing God's love. Will you stand up with me? Let me read something over you. Might be familiar. Come to me, all you are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What if 5,000 or so folks that call Northway home took this serious? went at this for the next few months, what would Christmas look like? You know, one of the times where I feel like the most soul rest that I ever have throughout the year is sitting in here on Christmas Eve singing Silent Night. It doesn't have to be just one time a year. You can have a silent night every day. You can find that peace. You can have that rest. You can feel that goodness and warmth of a, of a close and, and loving Lord every day. So, Father God, as, as a church, help us. Help us, Lord. We cry out to you. We, we want to be folks that are incredible ambassadors 
of pursuing your love, of passing that to our kids and then taking it out into a world that desperately knows to know that you are real and you are loving and that we can find rest in you. In your son's name, amen.